ask the board to identify themselves as present. I, Bob Springer, here, chair of the committee. John Jeffries, member present. Bob and Hunter, board of selectmen, present. And I will introduce Chris Dwelly, our town administrator, who is here, and Chief uh, Peter McGowan, who is here. Um, and um, we can get off to the meeting. So item one is, um, see if I get it. Police Chief uh, McGowan has, let me just, I gotta get out of this and I gotta get into this. Uh, appointments of Officer John Holmes as a full-time police officer and officer has his name Ali as a part-time police officer. Um, Chief McGowan. Yes. Thank you for uh, fitting me into the agenda. Uh, we'll do one at a time if that's okay. We'll go through and get the motions from the board if, uh, if my recommendation is accepted. Um, I'm here before you um, due to an unexpected resignation, Officer Harry Grabert, our school resource officer and officer who's been with Dover for about 12 years, um, has decided that uh, police work was no longer for him. So he's, uh, he's resigned and stepped down from the department and uh, we wish him the best. So as is our custom here, we have a, um, a group of special officers, part-time officers that we, um, that we hire and when it's time we pick from that group to select our next full-time officer. And John Holmes has been with us since 2018. John's been uh, a great asset to the department. He's, um, <clears throat> he's been working for us on the overnight shift, the 11 to seven, uh, filling in our, our dispatch shift that we lost when Northeastern University closed their co-op program. So he's been around um, basically full-time for us for a couple of years now, and he fits in really well. Uh, should the board uh, accept my recommendation, um, we'll start at the paperwork, hopefully getting him into, um, police academy in the end of September with a graduation sometime around March. So as you can see, it's a pretty long process to, to get an officer up and running. So, um, officer Holmes, uh, is highly recommended by me and I hope the board, uh, accepts the recommendation subject to the normal, um, caveats of successful completion of the police academy, his medical and the PAT attempt. So um, that is my recommendation for the next full-time officer. Okay. Chief, if you can go to the, to the part-time officer, I'm gonna make, I'll make one motion. Oh, great, okay, perfect. So now that we're-, can I, we're can I ask please. a question about Officer sure. Holmes? Is, yes. Is he gonna step into the, the school officer role? No, um, that's a good question, but no. Um, I have a meeting with the superintendent um, this week to discuss the school resource officer position. Um, you may not be aware, but uh, two or three years ago with the Criminal Justice Reform Act, um, part of the law of the past uh, had a provision that the superintendent and the police chief have to meet once a year to discuss the school resource officer position and any recommendations that I have for that position uh, have to be uh, run by him first. So um, before we make any moves, I've got to sit down with the superintendent and make sure okay. that uh, we're all on the same page. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the next, um, the next appointment that I'd, I'd uh, ask the board, uh, recommend to the board is uh, Hasnan Ali. Um, he came to us um, about three and a half, four months ago, maybe a little longer. We had an interview panel. Um, and the panel selected three candidates uh, to be hired as special officers. Um, with the size of my department and my training component, I couldn't handle three at the same time. So we selected the first two and Haas was uh, a very close third. So um, we had a, a part-timer resign uh, recently and Haas uh, was next up. I spoke with the committee and they were uh, definitely in favor of bringing Haas in. Um, I reached out to him and he was still interested. So we're very fortunate that um, he was still available as a free agent. Uh, he currently works as a staff sergeant for the Boston College Police Department. Um, he's been there about seven or eight years. 
and he works part time for the Princeton Police Department. Um, and it's my understanding that once he gets up and running for Dover, um, he'll give up the Princeton Police Department and dedicate his time uh, to Dover. Uh, he lives in Framingham and um, has quite a few certifications and um, classes under his belt. And I think he'll be a great asset to our department. John or Robin, any questions? Chief, I have a, I have a question. The, the um, Hans has been at BC for how long? Seven years. Woo. I've had kids at BC for the past eight years. You think so, he knows any of my kids? You probably paid his salary for the last few years. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> just not nice. Oh, God. <sighs> Robin? I don't have it. Other than the question I already asked, I don't have any questions. Okay. So then I move to approve the appointment of Officer John Holmes as a full time police officer and Officer Hasnain Ali as a part time police officer to the Dover Police Department, subject to the successful completion of customary required testing. Perfect. Second. All in favor? I, Robin Hunter. I, John Jeffries. I, Bob Springer. You're good, Chief. Perfect. I appreciate that. Um, we'll get things Chief. up and, and see if we can't keep things uh, running smoothly across the street there. Chief, right. is Harry gone? Harry's yes. gone. Yep, Harry's uh, on his way. Uh, Last day was uh, a week ago Friday. Great man. Really, the kids loved him. He did a really, really, really great job at DS. Agreed. Agreed. It's definitely a loss for the department. You can go have dinner now. Lucky you. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I appreciate you fitting me in. Okay, so item 1.2, Purdue Farmer Bankruptcy Proceedings. Um, Purdue Farmer filed for bankruptcy last September after being sued by several municipalities over its role in creating the opiate crisis. Dover, as a potential claimant, must submit to the bankruptcy court a proof of claim to collect money that may be owed to the town out of the, bank out of the bankruptcy estate. The presenter on this is going to be uh, Chris Lelly and Christina Marshall of Anderson Krieger. Chris? Chris? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will actually, uh, since you gave uh, such a great introduction, I'll actually just shift it right over to uh, Christina Marshall at this point to give the board a quick summary of, uh, of the case uh, and the potential options for the board to consider this evening. Great. Thank you. And it's nice to meet you all um, via Zoom. Uh, so this, uh, as you're all aware, a number of states and municipalities around the country have been bringing lawsuits um, arising out of the opioids crisis, most often naming Purdue Pharma, um, some of the members of the Sackler family and other opioid manufacturers and distributors um, and seeking damages against those entities for the harms um, that have affected their towns individually, whether that be lost tax revenue, um, the overtime spent on police and firefighters, um, opioid reducing medications, things like that. Um, last fall, Purdue filed for bankruptcy, um, which essentially cuts off most of those claims. Um, and there is a deadline in the bankruptcy proceeding of July 30th for any person, including any governmental entity, to file a proof of claim in the bankruptcy. Um, and that essentially puts uh, the town in line to receive some sort of payout from the bankruptcy. Um, I think based on what we understand of how this bankruptcy is likely to resolve, it's on one town, particularly smaller towns, um, will actually receive direct money. It's more likely that the money will be allocated through states and larger cities like Boston um, and kind of trickle down from there. Um, there is a possibility, as there always is in a bankruptcy proceeding, that there would be direct payouts to everybody who files a proof of claim, um, including Dover, if it chose to do so. Um, weighing your options here, if the town decides not to file a proof of claim, um, that would essentially cut off the town's ability to assert any claims against Purdue Pharma and likely the Sackler family in the future. Um, 
I think the town has weighed that possibility and decided against it. So you should, you know, consider for yourselves how important that ability is. Um, on the flip side, filing a claim certainly puts you in line, like I said, for a potential payout here. Um, I think it's unlikely uh, that there will be a direct payout, but on balance, um, from a legal perspective, I think there's very little to lose in filing a proof of claim. So we would recommend doing so here. Um, it's pretty straightforward to file a proof of claim. You don't need an attorney to do it. We would recommend um, using an attorney and it shouldn't take too long at all. Um, but those are your options and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Christine. John? Christine, uh, approximately cost of filing ballpark for the town? Uh, we are filing these on behalf of many of our towns. So the costs are really spread out um, among six or seven towns at the moment. And I think it would probably take three to four hours of work dedicated to Dover specifically. Great. Thank you. That's all for me. Robin? I don't have any comments. I think it's probably, you know, it's, we should just, I, I, I would recommend moving forward and just having them file the claim for us. Okay. Um, and so if I remember the, the documentation right, the, the, the relative amount of money, the possibility of recovering money is, is pretty minute, it's pretty minute, right? It's pretty small, uh, but we just want to re retain a position in the process. Exactly. It's, it's a small amount, but it protects your rights. Okay. Um, so um, I move to authorize Anderson Krieger to file a proof of claim to the town of Dover in connection with the bankruptcy estate of the In Re Purdue Farmer LP at all case number 19-236-49. Second, John Jeffries. All in favor. Aye, Bob Springer. Aye, Robin Hunter. Aye, John Jeffries. Done. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So item 1.3, an update from uh, Colonial Water. Bob, are you going to, Nick? Who's yeah. yeah, we're here. Sorry, the camera is not um, exactly working very well. I, we're, we're pretty dark on our end. I don't know how we look for you guys. Yes, you look like you're the shadow group. Yeah. <laughs> Not by design. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so uh, as an update, um, we are currently still running the emergency floor log uh, treatment at, um, at Francis, uh, at the Francis Street Station. Uh, we we're working, we've submitted some preliminary calculations to the DEP for their review. Um, for working through the permanent disinfection system. Uh, you know, as I may have discussed previously, once we get that uh, permanent system in, we're going to really increase the storage uh, before it reaches Francis Street. So, you know, right now we're chlorinating, you know, a little higher than we'd like to, but still within perfectly safe limits. Um, but when we actually get this permanent system in place, uh, the chlorine levels are going to drop by more than half. Um, so we're in the process of doing that with DEP. Um, we recently submitted our level two assessment for review to the DEP and that is, um, that's the assessment that was done by a third party uh, as an investigation to see if there were any noticeable causes uh, for the, the E. coli issue. Um, the findings of that report did not find any sanitary defect uh, with our facility um, or, our, or our sampling procedures. Um, at this point, uh, it, it's, you know, it's really leaning towards being in the groundwater as I think as we had suspected um, initially. Uh, so, you know, moving forward, uh, we're gonna, you know, keep working with the DEP and uh, try and get this uh, permanent system uh, constructed, you know, Sometime in the in the fall to late fall, uh, depending on the permitting timeline and um, you know and, and when we can get the approvals. So um, late fall that means sort of in the November time frame. 
Um, yeah, probably the latest in that in that time frame. You know, we don't want to, you know, have it uh, go out too long. Um, it's number one, you know, because we want to get the permanent system in place, and then we don't want to run into any challenges with, uh, you know, the colder weather moving in. Yep. Okay. Um, John. The permit. Can you just speak? Uh, briefly, if, if possible, the, the permanent disinfection system, can can you give us just, uh, you know, the, the scope and, and how that system is going to differentiate from the current system, if at all? Uh, there's not going to be much of a difference um, right now. You know, in order to get the, the temporary system in place, you know, we were really tied to using the existing pipe that's there, obviously, because we couldn't get a, you know, get a you know, uh, a new system constructed that quickly. Um, but we have the initial infrastructure in place within the station. Uh, we now have, you know, chlorine injection pumps for all three wells uh, that are tied to uh, an analyzer, chlorine analyzer, uh, which, um, you know, the analyzer talks to the SCADA system, which is our remote operating or our, our remote monitoring system that uh, will you know, send alarms to our operators if the levels are too high or too low of the chlorine levels. Um, so that infrastructure is in place. Uh, so really uh, what's left to do is install, basically install a larger pipe within the driveway, you know, our access road to the Francis Street Station. Um, that larger pipe is, is going to give us more, you know, what they call contact time or treatment uh, with, the, with the chlorine. Um, so the big difference is, uh, you know, aside from us installing the pipe, the big difference is going to be that um, the chlorine level that we that we dose with currently is going to be, you know, uh, you know, cut by more than half. When you say the three stations, so Francis Street, Draper Road, what's the third? Oh no, excuse me, the three wells. Yes. Are, that feed that feed the Francis Street station. Yes. There there are three separate lines that go into the station and there's a chlorine injection now on every every well line. So it all combines then and goes out to Francis Street. Two two weeks ago, Nick, you used the, the term manifold. There was a, a there, there are multi there are multi wells, they're they're tied together. Is the same thing, is the same system at, uh, and on Draper Road as Francis Street? Yeah, Draper Road's very similar. Um, at Draper Road, they, you know, the wells basically, yeah, they come into the, uh, they come into the station uh, and there's a chlorination on a single, on the, on the single where the manifold comes together, where the, I guess where the two well supplies come together, there's a single chlorination point there. Um, that's a little different than what we're doing at Francis, uh, just, for space considerations um, and uh, the difference in pumping rates, you know, uh, at Draper Road, our our pumps, you know, run at you know roughly the same um, you know, the, the same flows. Uh, at Francis Street, you know, two of the wells run at roughly the same flows, and there's one that's a much larger producer, a higher flow rate. So that's why we're we've got. Uh, injection individually on those wells because of the different flow rates. I see. Does does the flow rate have a, a lot well we, we had a lot of conversation. There's a lot of of back and forth with with regards to flow rates and consumption. And you know you pointed out, we pointed out it's consumption equals flow rates. And is the system the is the system currently designed to be able to handle the flow, flow rates that are elevated. Now, that's going to be a question that we'll get from our constituents. And number two, um, the, there, there's a constituency that lives very close to both Francis Street and Draper, Draper Road. And what happens, one of the questions that we, we received on the chat was, if there's over pumping a lot of, a lot of activity at the Francis Street well, and there's a there's a constituent who's on a private well and their well runs dry, you know that that was a concern that kept coming up again and again and again. How, how do we address that? 
how do we even begin to um, put parameters around what we should be pumping to a max or what you should be pumping? We should be consuming, you should be pumping. Well, it, a, a big culprit, you know, as, as we're in the you know, high demand season now, um, a big culprit is uh, there's a lot of irrigation in Dover. Um, and that, you know, that spikes our, that spikes our pumping, our, what we call our production from the wells uh, during the summer months. And, um, you know, as far as how the town could help, you know, uh, as part of our Water Management Act permit, uh, you know, we have approached the town uh, about instituting an ordinance um, for irrigation. Uh, we don't have we don't have the statutory authority uh, to, you know, correct the situation, I guess, levy any sort of fine. Um, at this point, you know, we don't have control over people irrigating their lawn. And the thing with the system is, you know, we're going to produce as much water as, as is demanded. Otherwise, if we, you know, we'd have to shut down wells to prevent, you know, uh, you know, it, I guess what, I, what I'm saying is we, we produce what is demanded. So if the demand goes down, um, we would be pumping less over a period of time. So, so uh, yeah, and, and, and an ordinance for, for irrigation would probably be the first step. Thank you. I think it, just, to, just to add to that point, um, we do actively uh, put on our bill messages, and as I'm sure if you're on the town system, you've seen some of the, the rave alerts come through, where it, it, it states specifically, you know, our kind of regulation that we have as a water company is to, uh, watering twice a week, not between the times of 5 in the morning, uh, 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. So yeah. you know, that's, that's our um, attempt to, again, try to, try to move that notion across the table uh, to all the users that, you know, that there, that there needs to be a conservation mindset or thought um, to not have that over pumping on any particular day. Uh, I, I agree. We, as you know, all three of the selectmen are, are customers of yours, and we disconnected our irrigation system 15 years ago, you know, specifically for that reason. So. Okay. And especially, you know, this year being uh, as hot as it is, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're noticing, um, we're noticing that kind of demand on the system through the irrigation. That's all for Robin? Right, so I have a couple of questions. You know, I think, I think we all decided that we would address the conservation measures as a group. As a colonial customer, I, I do get notifications telling me um, the restrictions that apply to the ability to irrigate. And I think, again, it's, it's a whole town um, issue that we need to work on together. With, specifically with, with, with respect to um, colonial, will you continue to run the temporary chlorination system until you have a permanent system in place? I think we lost them. Too many tough questions from John. Right. I've got no one waiting in the queue. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe we could get an answer from them. No, I believe the answer is yes. But. Yeah, I think they must have, I think they're obligated to do that. Right, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, the other, the other two questions I want to, the, if we can't get them back, the other two questions I'd want to ask them is, um, well, I've heard from people about the, the smell and taste of the chlorination in the, in the water. Um, and, um, you know, to the point where people are telling me that it's not really drinkable. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that can be done about that, but that's something that we should ask Colonial to address. And then I was just going to ask if um, there were, if there continued to be confusion about the reimbursement issues. 
Um, there seems to be a couple of people who are having a tough time. And, and uh, again, I haven't heard anything of it. You know, I was just wondering if they had heard anything. So maybe Chris, you could follow up. Oh, they're, they're just came. Okay. All right, so, okay. Sorry about hey, where'd that. you guys go? Yeah. Are we? Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Oh, all right, so this, right. Madam Hunter was, uh, was uh, had the floor, so I'm gonna give it back. Right, so, so I just wanted to confirm that um, the temporary chlorination system will continue to run until a permanent chlorination system is put in place. That's correct, and um, the infrastructure I mentioned earlier, the uh, the chlorine analyzer, um, you know, being tied into our SCADA system, uh, is operational. So if if there are any issues, you know, our, our operators will get alarms uh, sent to them. Um, so you know, it's going to be operational until until the permanent system. Right. And then also a second question I have, and I just also wanted to confirm this as well, that the D, you will be working with the DEP to approve the permanent system, correct? Yes, we've already been in discussions with them, have submitted some preliminary information. Um, mm -hmm. I have a call tomorrow with uh, someone from DEP um, you know, to discuss that further. Uh, but yes, it's going to require DEP approval for us to do this. So we, you know, um, so we're submitting applications and and the required forms and calculations to uh, to get that done. So, uh, you know, we'll be working very closely with them. We can't we can't put it into operation uh, without their permission. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. So uh, I had um, two follow up things as well. Uh, from residents. One was pe some people are experiencing um, uh, it's, the smell and taste of the chlorine is making it very difficult to drink or use the water. Is that something that can be addressed or not addressed? Well, uh, it's, again, it's a small number of people. I don't, I don't really know um, where they are in the system, but that was one of the issues coming up. Right. At this point, um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, we're running it higher than would normally be expected. Uh, you know, still well within safe limits, um, you know, quite, quite a bit lower than, uh, you know, the maximum limits. And, you know, it, it's, it, that's what we have to do right now uh, because, of the, because the pipes we have right now are too small, I guess is the best way to put it. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's kind of proportional. You know, the larger the pipe gets, more storage, the less chlorine you have to use. Um, so right now, it's you know, unfortunately, that's that's just the situation we have to uh, you know deal with until we get this permanent system in place. Okay. And secondly, it was about reimbursements. In the last the last time we had, we had a couple of people who still seem to be a little bit confused about the reimbursement process. Are you hearing anything on your end about that, or is it pretty quiet? Um, I would say, I mean, for the but for the most part, it would been relatively quiet. Uh, so you know, we're we're still getting some of the uh, the water purchase reimbursement forms are um, being picked up at the office. Uh, so I just brought back. I don't know. I was I was up in Dover on uh, Monday. I probably brought back a dozen or so for water purchases. Uh, we are receiving some uh, in the mail as well. So those are being processed um, presently. Uh, so I would expect that those are going to go out for the for the water purchases over the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, as far as invoice credits go, we have received a few phone calls uh, into the office, and you know we're explaining uh, the calculations and how we arrived at those uh, particular credits. Uh, and then we also note uh, to anybody that calls that there is a, a worksheet that's on our website as well. Um, so if they need further kind of visual explanation. Uh, that worksheet there as well, but uh, for, I guess what I would consider to be fairly quiet on our end when it comes to discussing reimbursement at this point. You know, there's a lot of discussion up, up to um, the boil order being lifted, but since then it's been relatively quiet. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't. Uh, so I think we'll we'll let you guys go and enjoy a little bit of uh, evening and. Um, if something, uh, we may want to, you know, sort of revisit progress along the way 
um, and, and uh, um, probably at our late August meeting, it's sort of a month from now, if you guys would be amenable to come in and just give us a quick update. Sure, sure. So, we can do that. I was gonna make uh, just one more further point. Um, on the level two assessment, uh, we did, I, I did notify several uh, residents and customers while we were hand, handing out water that once that assessment was accepted by DEP that we would post that on the website. So that, that still is the intention. It's still under review from DEP. Uh, so once DEP does accept that, I'll, I'll have that posted on the website as well. So anybody that may be interested can, uh, can read through it as well. Okay. Um, last word, John, Robin. All right, thank you guys. Have a nice evening. Great. Thank you. Good thank evening. you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Good night. Thank you. So uh, we have revisiting the uh, solar project for the highway, and I think Beth Greenblatt from Beacon Integrated Solutions and Jessica Wall from Anderson Krieger are going to lead or participate in the discussion. Uh, good evening, members of the board, Jessica Wall, Anderson and Krieger. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear us this evening. Um, so we wanted to provide you with a quick update on the DPW uh, building solar roof project, which we had discussed with you at your last meeting. Uh, with me, as, as you mentioned, is Beth Greenblatt, who's been looking at some of the project financials. Um, the decision for the board on the topic is whether to proceed with a letter of intent with select. So we aren't at the, at the stage of project contracting or anything like that yet. It's really a question of whether to proceed with the project and if so, to enter into a letter of intent. Um, so just as a brief recap from the last meeting, we had talked about the roof as, the, as one potential issue associated with the project. Um, the roof is at the end of its warranty period. Um, it was unclear whether the roof would need some repairs in order to proceed with uh, a solar installation for the next 20 years. That's the proposed term of the contract. Um, so there were two options that were proposed. Um, one was to incorporate the roof work into the power purchase agreement pricing. Select had offered to contract with a subcontractor to perform the roof repairs. And then the cost of that would get rolled into the PPA pricing. The cost of the roof work uh, based on the estimate that we've gotten from Select is about $85,000. So that's option one. Um, option two was for the town to, if it wanted to proceed, handle the roof upgrades itself um, as a separate scope and then revisit solar at a later date uh, once those repairs were made. So at, at the last meeting, I know that there were questions from the board about uh, when capital improvements to the roof would occur in the normal course to understand that, one, the timing and two, the pricing of that. Um, so we had a good conversation with the town manager and with uh, Carl Warnick, who I see is on, on the Zoom call this evening, um, to better understand that. And the information that we received was that uh, 10 years from now, in 2030, the roof is scheduled for, it's unclear whether it's a replacement or a repair, but it's at least $80,000 worth of work. And then eight years later, in 2038, an additional $28,000 worth of work. So that's what's in the, the capital planning for the project. Okay. Um, so I wanted to offer just a few factors for the board's review. Um, again, we're happy to answer questions or, or talk through whatever issues uh, you think are relevant. It's possible to think about whether to proceed with the project from an economic perspective, from an environmental and policy perspective. And then there's also a certain educational value uh, that we see a lot with solar projects. So it, with this new information about capital improvements, um, I think that it, it's fair to say, and, and Beth should feel free to chime in, uh, that there are certainly savings to the town uh, by virtue of doing the project. Uh, there's a value in locking in your solar pricing now for the future, assuming that cost of utilities will in, uh, increase over time. Um, the savings on this project or the returns as Beth has uh, forecasted them with the roof work are not huge, but they're still substantial. Um, and it also adds another 20 years of warranty to the roof. And so what you're essentially doing is pushing off that $100,000 worth of work that would have occurred over the next 18 years on the roof down the road. So that's the economics of it. 
Um, but I should note that there's still, there is still a premium associated with doing the work, the roof work and including it in the PPA. Um, Beth's estimate was that over the course of the contract, it would be about $160,000 total as part of the PPA, but there'd be no uh, upfront costs to the town to doing that. It's all paid out over the life of the contract. Um, from an environmental perspective, uh, just a few things to keep in mind. The way that solar pricing works in the Commonwealth, uh, it incentivizes getting in the door and getting projects online earlier rather than later. So the incentives are sort of better for earlier than later. So there is some value to getting in the door and getting a project set up earlier as opposed to waiting. Um, and then also, you know, Dover is a green community. Uh, solar is, is a part of, you know, those sorts of initiatives. And then finally, uh, from an educational perspective, we've found, um, or I have found on other projects, that there's sort of a fun component or an educational component uh, to the town on solar projects. There, there's software that you can see in real time how, you know, the savings and the energy produced and there's sort of an educational interest component there. So I offer that all for your consideration. I know that was a lot of information. Um, we're happy to answer questions. And, and Beth, I, if I've missed anything, please let me know. Okay, thank you. I think Beth, has she done a good job? She, she has indeed. The only thing I might add is, again, as Jess said, by investing in, I understand that the town has made a commitment to green initiatives as becoming a green community. And this gives you an opportunity to pursue rather than just buy, clipping coupons from net metered facilities, this allows you to really in, uh, uh, provide for an on-site facility. It's one of the, the only locations in the community and I believe there was some good due diligence to evaluate all of the other options. It's not the best site for solar, but it's a decent site. And as Jess said, you know, even with the roof, there is some savings um, and it also provides you with that added benefit of being able to push another 20 years down the line, that $100,000 capital investment. The premium you're paying for it is because Select is financing it um, in their models. They're going out and borrowing money to do all of this work, um, including the solar, and there's a, a cost of capital to do that. Yep. So the town is bearing that cost. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, uh, Beth. I, I, um, you recalled our conversations uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when, when you were first presented this. I was, by memory, doing the, the cost, the increases in the tranches based on 5%. And I think, Beth, you corrected my, my math, and it was about 4% of the, diff, the variance between the tranche, or how you refer to it as the, the first tranche, second tranche, third tranche, we're in the third. So I, I just did the $80,000 in my math based upon 3%, and it still works out to be a better deal for us, even if it was a 3% differential rather than 4% or 5%. So I, unless Carl could, you know, come up with a real specific reason why this at this time it would not be a good I idea to do it. I, I'm I was in favor of it at five percent, and I'm still in favor of it even if we reduce even if the tranche came back at three percent. So, I, I I think it's a I think it's a step in the right direction. I think it's something from the town standpoint that we're committed to, and there's a a a, a, a minor cost of capital to us. But as you both have said, it, it's something that we are eventually going to have built into our system, into our budgeting process anyway. So I, 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 am, uh, I am in favor of it, Mr. Chair, and I'd be happy to hear what Robin and you have to say. Robin? So I, so I have a couple of questions for Beth. So, you know, clearly if the town, and maybe Chris, and maybe we talked about it, Chris, and I just couldn't remember. Um, I, I think the town's cost of capital is probably less than select. So in theory, we, it, we could go out and, you know, borrow the money ourselves or pay the $85,000. And then we, you know, the payback period for that is, is shorter, basically, because we would still continue to get 
well, the savings we would get are, are, are over double than what they are when select finances it themselves. That's, that's, I'm, am I looking at this right? Yeah, I mean, let me, let me suggest one other sort of qualifier in this. So right now there's still some capacity in block four. Okay. If the town were to make a determination soon and Jess and Select agreed on a, a letter of intent or some other contracting vehicle, Select would apply immediately for incentives under the, under the SMART program and try to lock in that 4%, that block four better value. Um, if the town goes out to bid, and I'll defer to Chris on this, um, but it's putting together the procurement documents, doing a public procurement, making a selection, arranging with the contractor, that's gonna delay the project. I would guess, particularly in these COVID times, I would guess probably into next year. And you could be in block five or block six at that point, and you perhaps may have eroded some of that economic benefit. But for sure, your cost of capital is lower than theirs as a public not nonprofit, high credit entity. Right, so on the pro side, on the pro side, we could increase the useful life of the roof basically by 20 years um not put out any money right now uh lock in um hopefully block four but maybe block five and still assuming the cost of power or electricity is going to go up there would still be savings to the community. I, I mean, we understand, you know, some of the comments from citizens are, well, you're not getting a lot, you know, you should go out and try and do bigger projects. But I think we, we tried that and the schools wanted to be on their own. And that's where there's much larger surfaces. And as far as town buildings go, we looked at the protective agencies it's unclear to us, um, you know, whether the community center is going to be a new building or whether we're going to keep the current building. So making any a decision based upon that um, is probably two or three years down, down the road for us. So I think I, uh, to me, there's also a feel good component to doing this. You know, as, as a green community and, and having been the selectman that, um, you, you know, was the one that, that got that going, I would like to see us continue to do programs like this, regardless of how small the savings are, because everything we do as, as individuals, as a town, to reduce our carbon footprint, no matter how small it is, is going to contribute you know, to, to all of us making a bigger impact. So, you know, my, my position is there's more benefits to doing that, this than not doing this. So I, I would agree with John. Okay, so I'll throw the cold water on the parade. Um, I think the project is, has marginal benefits to the town. Um, and, and, um, and I've, and again, I've done some research and people have told me that it's, 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 it, it is, it's marginal at best. Um, but I, I, so that's one thing. Number two, I think that energy and, um, sustainability in general is really a big issue and we ought not to, uh, be doing one-off projects, whether feel good or not, um, around these kinds of things that we really need to be serious about it. We need to take a, a strategic look at energy. We need to take a strategic look at water. We need to take a strategic look at space. And we have to plan for the future. And, and clearly, a bigger project can give us bigger bang for the buck. Um, there are many other aspects of energy um, that we should be considering. Um, and so um, it just comes down to, if it was my money, right? If it was my money and I was buying an EV, and I did the analysis and it was sort of a marginal uh, project. Um, well, then I, it, if it's my money, I could, I could do a marginal project or even cost me a little bit of money. 
more of the planet. Um, but this is pound money. Um, and I have a different attitude about spending pound money. And I, I would be always looking for um, bang for the buck. Um, we take on 20 years of risk. We don't, you know, if anything goes along with the, if anything goes haywire with the roof over the next 20 years, the profit margin is gone. Um, and so I, or the, the return is negative. And so I, I just am not in favor of one or low bore um, projects for a field of debate for field good purposes. But I think it's two to one. Right, so regarding the roof, I, I believe when Select came in and Chris, we did talk about what would happen if, um, if we had to repair the roof. And, and, and I believe you can remove the solar panels, repair the roof and put them back back on and and it's not it's not a huge expense it was something that we talked to them about carl am i misremembering or chris no we had the conversation about the ability to take the panels off if there is a repair that's needed um but that would come at a cost and uh and i think you know maybe beth or jess could speak in their experience um, or better speak to what that cost might look like that, if that were to happen. But that's why the, the roof re repair became, I think, such a, an important factor as we were analyzing this project is that with the roof out of warranty and anticipated capital costs in the next five to 10 years, let's say, you wouldn't want to go and put solar panels on a roof for 20 years and then have to pull them back down midway through. Right. And this membrane product that Select has identified really will create a, a full 20-year warranty, which is obviously not to say that there aren't oftentimes in or out of warranty repairs that may need to happen, and there will be a provision in the contract. The bigger issue is a wholesale replacement of a roof versus a small minor repair that takes parts of the system out off for a short period of time. And as long as the town could work with select so that it can be done when generation, um, the, the ability to generate solar is at a, at a, you know, a, a low, lesser time, I, I would expect they would work with the town on that. But again, this roof solution is designed to add another 20 years of life to the existing roof surface. And to coincide with the useful life of the actual panels, correct? Correct. Right. Correct, yeah. And Select would be responsible for the, the disposal of those panels. It wouldn't be an expense of the town. Correct. You know, I just, we own so few buildings without the school. I, again, I, I go back to, you know, Carol, if it's a new building, we're probably do, um, So I, I don't know what's what's going to happen over there. So I, you know, I, I, I still think even though the benefits are marginal, there's still a benefit there regardless. Actually, so I have a question that Jess or Beth, one of you may be able to answer from from a um, a participant. They are wondering if there are any state grants available. Um, after, for the, so the question is, are there any state grants available after we, we did the transfer station zoning and install? So I think this person may want to know if there are any state grants available to help offset the cost of, of the installation, or is that all wrapped into the, um, into the financial, benefit? So um, as, as many of you may know, Mass um, CEC does provide some s support and funding for solar PV installations for consumers. For the commercial and municipal market, um, the expectation is the incentives that's offered to offset costs, so it's revenue coming into the project, coming through the SMART program is designed to help make these projects economic. Um, Currently, it is not my understanding that there are federal or state 
grants available, even as a green community, to install solar PV. Whether that could happen in the future, it would likely be an opportunity to use competitive grant money toward the cost, which likely would not be enough to build a project of this size. Um, and it probably would exclude you from participating in SMART, similar to the old ARA funds. So I would say the short answer is, is really the only available resources, financial resources, to support this program, it, this type of project is the SMART program. Okay, which, which is what we're going through for this. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. And, and I, think, I think also um, what's gonna go hand in hand with this is, is also a pilot agreement that's gonna be put in place and that will bring in additional property or personal property tax revenue to the town, which we don't get today over, over the life of this solar facility. Yeah, and that pilot revenue is projected right now at about over the term, 60, a little, $66,000. Again, marginal, but more than what we get today. So there is no motion here. Chris? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I, so I can provide you with that. I, we kept that blank, you know, going in, uh, not knowing which direction the board may head, but I can uh, provide that to you. But if I may, I, I just, I wanted to ask of Beth and Jess, if they could just Kind of illuminate for the group this evening uh if the board were to move forward with a letter of intent you know what do the next steps look like for the community in terms of wrapping up the content on the contract language and also as as uh as robin mentioned um the pilot we still need approval from town meeting um for uh for that and um at present, we don't necessarily have a special town meeting scheduled for the fall. Um, so just all those things considered, it would just be helpful to hear from you on what, on what next steps would be if the board were to move forward this evening. So I can, I can cover that. Um, so in terms of next steps, the letter of intent lays out a sort of mutual understanding that the parties agree to negotiate, that there would be site inspections made, and it, it's sort of a, document showing that the parties want to move forward in good faith. If the parties can't reach agreement about the terms of a power purchase agreement or a lease or a pilot, then the letter of intent would expire. So if there's no sort of locking in per se with the letter of intent. Um, so if we do proceed, the next steps would be the site investigation. Um, we would need to work with select to uh, set up and, and better understand the contracting arrangement for the roof membrane and the warranties with that because the warranties are intended to transfer to the town upon completion. Um, and we would work through contracting documents. We have from other municipalities that A and K has worked with uh, select on, on contract documents. We have some good templates that we think cover uh, most of what would need to be covered. So I'm hoping that the contracting would be relatively straightforward. And then once that's all in place and we're moving through the SMART project or the SMART program, excuse me, um, we'll get our information back about what incentives we're locked in at um, and, that, and then we'll continue to move forward. Um, in terms of the pilot, we'll have to work with the assessor's office to make sure that we think that everything is uh, on the up and up and, and fair in terms of the right numbers. That can affect the PPA price because the, the two values talk to each other in, in terms of the power purchase price and the pilot itself. Um, so that's one step about uh, that we would need to cover. And then in terms of the pilot, um, I would want to go back and look at the votes uh, for this particular project. We can do, we can address the pilot in one of two ways. Either the pilot as a fully formed document would come to town meeting for its own review, or town meeting could vote to delegate to the board or to the town manager to finalize a pilot um, at a certain point. So we haven't, I haven't, in terms of timing, addressed the pilot timing quite in as much detail as I would like to at this point, primarily because we wanted to, to hear from the board how they wanted to proceed. So just to clarify here, um, say we sign the letter of intent, select puts in the application, uh, we're fortunate enough to still qualify for block four 
but we don't have town meeting approval on the pilot program and we actually have to wait until May of 2021, hopefully by then we can have a town meeting, um, <laughs> to, get, to get approval. Um, will, so will block force do, so my question is, will we still qualify for, for, for block? So we would lock in those rates regardless of when the project actually happens. And if for some reason we decided or select decided we couldn't move forward with the program, no harm, no foul, our qualification just goes back to block four. Yeah, so the, the, the way the SMART program works in general is you apply for what's called a preliminary statement of qualification. And once you get that, you're sort of locked in at whatever that value is at the time. You get your final qualification when you get the project built. One of the changes that was made um, in the, the changes to the regulations is that the public sector gets an automatic 24 months COVID helped the situation, but an automatic 24 months from the time it gets its certification to getting the project um, built and mechanically complete. So you have, you have plenty of time to do that. Okay. What, what will likely transpire is if the board approves this project and the town enters into a, a letter of intent, select will, I suspect, and um, I see select is on the call, I suspect they will take um, sort of they will undertake two different efforts. One is to apply for SMART certification as a public project. And the second is to make an application to Eversource for interconnection to get that very long process started. That process can be as short as, you know, a month, unlikely, um, but as long as two to three, you know, two to three to five months. So, okay. and that's a gating issue. If the utility comes back, Eversource comes back and says it's going to be $2 million to interconnect this asset for some crazy reason, the project has likely fallen apart. Right. I, I would say it has. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, just, just to Beth's point on that, um, we usually have in contract documents, there's a provision that says if Eversource comes back and says the, it's going to cost half a million dollars to make this project happen or to integrate it with the rest of the power grid, the, the parties have an out to say, that's not what we contemplated. We're not interested in doing that. If it's a lower number, sometimes it's you know, $5,000, $10,000 of repairs. Sometimes the parties try and work that out to make things move forward. But there's no obligation to do that. Yeah. Uh, no, not typically. Okay. I, I don't have any more questions. Okay, um, so then I'm going to move to authorize the town administrator to sign a letter of intent with Select Energy for the proposed solar project at the town highway garage. I'll second that. Aye, John Jeffries, in favor. Aye, Robin Hunter, in favor. Uh, Bob Schmidt, uh, not in favor. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Have a good rest of your evenings. You too. Okay. Board of Selectmen update. 1.5. So I don't think we have any updates. The only thing I would ask is, is I know there was a initial set of interviews for the architect for the Carroll building. Would you cover that in your in the town administrator update? Okay. Um, and I would say, so I, I do have, I'll, I'll, I'll cover, Chris, unless you will, I would cover the, um, uh, the task force meeting um, that we had on Friday last. Um, for uh, the COVID stuff. Are you, gonna, are you intend to cover that as well? Uh, if uh, I was gonna mention something, but um, since you're mentioning now, Mr. Chairman, um, sure, go ahead. Um, okay, so we, um, we had um, uh, get together meeting on, on, uh, on Friday last, and um, I think there were a couple of issues that came up that um, were um, 
were important, and I and I want to take the opportunity at this meeting just to sort of talk about them a little bit um, and hopefully spread the word. So one one topic was was really around travelers. So there are, as you all know, a number of hotspots um, in the country in the South and West, um, and there's been a lot of discussion at the state level apparently about um, how do we handle travelers. Um, people who have written, who have driven on the uh, Mass Pike and other highways know that there's a sign that's up there that says if you're visiting Mass, you know, you're required to um, quarantine for 14 days. Um, and and um, the question is um, that I specifically asked of the Board of Health, what should we be doing in Dover to get the word out that if people are traveling to from back to back to Massachusetts, back to Dover, from one of the areas that are that are that are experiencing increased cases of COVID, how do we, uh, in, you know, press upon them the importance of quarantining? So that's going to be at an ongoing um, dialogue, and the state is also, um, uh, you know, trying to figure out a, a good way to encourage people to self quarantine uh, if they've traveled to and from those kinds of states. And then the second thing that we spent um, some time on, um, and I think it'll be a continuing discussion that doesn't affect us directly, but it obviously affects all the parents in town who have kids uh, going back to school in the fall. So there's just a tremendous amount of work that's taking place um, at the region. Um, they have multiple teams working on multiple aspects of uh, the process of trying to figure out how um, how they can safely open the schools in the fall for both the teachers and the students. Um, the level of detail is, is amazing and the amount of work that's being done is also amazing. Um, and I'm at, at a future meeting, probably at a meeting in August, maybe the second meeting in August, I'm gonna ask representatives either from the DOH or from the school to just give us five or 10 minutes on all the work that's going on. Uh, it's impressive. Um, there's still, people are still unsure about what's going to happen. And the level, and I tell you, the level of detail is mind boggling. So those are the, the two hot topics that I think that we spent time on last Friday and I think we'll continue to follow as we move into August. Um, otherwise, the news uh, from the COA and from Park and Rec, and I, I need to get, um, get updated again from Mark Gilhoney because they've also started to open up some programs um, and the early reports where everything was working incredibly well. People were well behaved, uh, people were used following the protocols and, and the first week of the first couple of days, or at least the first couple of days, um, went very well. And, that, uh, and then Janet was, was talking about several things um, that she's been doing for a long while. And again, um, all positive news. Janet, I don't know if you want to just give two minutes um, on, on what's going on over there. Sure, if you'd like me to. Um, I, as we talked about at the task force meeting, the uh, COA has been doing virtual programming to reach out to our people at home via using the Zoom technology and also uh, offering fitness classes uh, through Zoom as well as on the Dover Sherburn Cable TV as an option for them. Uh, we have uh, virtual cooking classes. We have virtual ukulele classes, uh, a weekly. We have, um, we're working on setting up an outside gathering. As we've we talked to many people, they're wanting to get together to do some small group gatherings. And we also have set up with our, um, we have a mini grant from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Needham uh, for the uh, veg fresh, fresh, fresh farm produce from Powissett Farm. So we're doing a drive-through pickup uh, every other Thursday behind the Carroll Community Center. And we're pairing that with our donations from Blue Moon Cafe over in Medfield. So people are able to drive through and pick up fresh produce and bread. And we have hand sanitizer and masks and whatever they need and just to try to do a check in. We're also delivering to people at home if they still need that service. And we are still providing um, 
masks on a regular basis uh, for all ages in the community. It is not just specific to the seniors in the community. And our newsletter just went out, which hopefully all of you received at home. And it is, I sent it off to be posted onto the town website, which has some information on virtual things you can do beyond the Dover sponsored programs that for travel or um, other things. So that there's a lot out there if you're feeling more homebound that you can still stay connected. Thank you. You're welcome. So John or Robin, any comments on the upcoming agenda? So I actually do, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the timing of the general increase. So it's scheduled to, to, to be on the agenda in September. You know, it's the personnel board comes and it always seems as though it's, it's, a, it's a big kind of rush and we don't get information in time. So I'm wondering, Chris, if it makes sense. I don't know when the personnel board's meeting, but maybe it makes sense for maybe just the chair to come on the August meeting and give us, you know, some of what, whatever they're thinking about, even if Warren hasn't decided on it. And then, um, you know, and then they could come back in, in September as well so, so that we can get the information earlier than we typically do. I mean, even if the personnel board can't, you know, perhaps if, if you or Kate could, could present the data just so that we can take a look at the data before September, if they have it. So that, that would be my, the only thing I, cause I know from last year and the year before it just, I, I always, feel bad because they're looking for us to make a decision and we've just gotten it. So I, I'm comfortable getting it even before they present it to Warren. You know, we wouldn't be, nobody would be looking for us to, to vote on it, but at least we could get an understanding of where, what they're thinking and we could then, you know, ask, ask any questions that we may have. Yeah, absolutely. So we're meeting with the uh, the personnel board in the next few weeks to uh, have the uh, personnel HR consultant who did a lot of the work that we've talked about, who's wrapped up the initial work. So the personnel board will be meeting with her and reviewing that. Uh, and we can, we will talk about that. And I'm glad that you mentioned it, Robin, because another thing that we were preliminarily discussing internally um, was conversations around the general increase and the timing of it, especially as we began to start our budget process in the midst of um, COVID, right? And the impact potentially what that has on the FY22 budget. And so we were, again, internally as a finance team talking about the timing of everything and whether or not the town's traditional timing with discussions around general increases and things like that still makes sense because we may, there, are still be, there may still be unknowns as it relates to the upcoming budget. Um, so, um, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, we'll have that conversation with Mary, see uh, what's best, and then we'll update the board. Okay. And I'm on a roll today. So one of the other thing is, I, I know I may be overly optimistic, but I'm thinking um, after Friday, we will have already established goals and objectives for the following year and prioritize them. So I'm wondering if maybe we could put it on the agenda for one of the August meetings because I think last year we presented it to the town as well. And, and I know I get a lot of really positive feedback. People, you know, citizens really like to, to see what we've decided our priorities. And then to, they, they really like the, the regular updates that we give on a, that not we, the royal we, give on a, um, on a quarterly basis. Clearly overly optimistic. The royal we. The royal we. John, anything? No. Can't possibly follow that. All right. So I would, I would, uh, on the on the issue of goals and objectives and presenting to the town. Um, my 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 reaction is, if I remember the process right, we were going to finish it up with luck. We'll finish it up on Friday, um, and then we're going to syndicate it. Um, and we're going to get feedback from the various and sundry boards and commissions. 
Um, and then we're going to incorporate, you know, um, that in. And I, I really would prefer, Robin, if we did the presentation to the town in September. Okay. Oh, no, that's fine. I just want to make sure it's on the agenda. Well, yes. The other, right. Only because I think that people may, you know, people who have an opportunity to, to vamoose uh, to other vacation spots um, will be back in September. Okay. And we give them time to incorporate feedback. You know, what's interesting is just in, in, in keeping along the same same thoughts that there's going to be a, a lot more activity in August. So for people like me who have kids in different parts of the country and in, in, in different parts of the country thinking about schools, there, the whole timetable of when and how we typically do things has really been in flux. I mean, we, we obviously have lived through it with regards to town meeting in, in the COVID era and all the things that we had to simply do to get this done. But in thinking through, you know, as Robin, you just said, people like to hear that because you typically then get feedback from people around the time that people are back from summer vacation, back to school and back into the swing of things, if you will, in September. I think that whole timeline is gonna change dramatically this year. Okay. Okay. So the other thing, Chris, is maybe on, uh, I don't know which date, the 12th or the 26th, um, I would have maybe ask either, either Jill uh, Fedor to come to the, BLA, the BLS meeting and tell us what's going on at the schools um, and or the BLA to tell us what's going on in the travel program. So just an asterisk for one of those two meetings. Okay. Um, item 1.6. Town Administrator updates. Mr. Dwelly, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, since it was mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, I just want to update the board and everyone that uh, the, uh, the, the Community Center Building Committee uh, started their interview process for design firms last night. Um, they met with uh, three firms um, uh, who were shortlisted um, from an initial um, a uh, number of uh, 15 who had uh, responded to our request for qualifications, uh, which is really great. Uh, the building committee will be meeting tomorrow night um, to interview three more, um, which is a total of six finalists that they've selected. And at the end of that meeting, um, we'll have a discussion and determine uh, uh, what their recommendation is for the board of selectmen um, for, the, uh, for the design form design firm, excuse me, um, for the community center um, building project. Um, so that's moving uh, right along uh, on schedule as anticipated. Uh, it's a great group of, um, of six finalists and uh, I'm encouraged um, uh, both by the process so far and that crop of candidates. Uh, Hale Reservation um, is on my list here. Um, we have, uh, the group took a little bit of a hi hiatus during, uh, certainly during the pandemic and then in preparation for a town meeting, um, but we're ready to pick things back up and have been soliciting um, proposals from uh, appraisal firms um, to understand both what a kind of scope of work as well as a, an associated cost for that work would be um, to get an updated appraisal uh, for the Hale property. Um, and the last thing uh, that I would mention um, to, uh, to the group this evening is, uh, is that the IT team uh, with our contractors and consultants are finalizing um, a lot of the hardware infrastructure that we have talked about, specifically about broadband accessibility um, in all of the town buildings, um, both so that it's available to staff as they move around the building and move around to conference rooms, um, but also for the public um, whenever we reopen so that um, folks who now have meetings either in the lower meeting room or in the selectmen's meeting room uh, can now connect um, to the internet which they weren't able to do before um, so all good things um, those are the kind of major highlights i have for for you this evening when we come back to the townhouse sometime in mm. 2021 <laughs> before we'll have wi-fi that's something to look forward to that's awesome 
I don't know. I think we should be building a palatial meeting room in Carroll for the, in the interim for us, you know? So it's set up like a TV studio so we could really, you know, shine. I, I still say an outdoor gazebo might be the way to go. You know, we can sit there with our <laughs> down jackets on, we'll be outside, but. <laughs> outdoor gazebo. Oh, oh Carl, can you stand <laughs> much for us a little outside? <laughs> Uh, Sorry, John, go ahead. No, I said, imagine how well an outdoor gazebo would work in January. Well, that's what I'm saying. It, <laughs> it, it won't be snow on the ground. It may be a little chilly, so you wear your boots and your down jacket and your hat and you go up, <laughs> but you'll have really good ventilation. You got to think, you got to think Scandinavia. We could have like a little sauna or something, you know. Even Rio thought that was a bad idea. He just got up and left your room. He just he isn't. He's right here. He's sleeping. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. Consent agenda. Summary. Designate Robin Hunter to approve accounts payable and payroll warrants. Right. So that <laughs> so that so I, I want to understand this because this is actually be problematic for me when I go back to my travel <laughs> Well, it's all done. It's all, it's all done, you know, electronically. You electronically? Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I'm fine with that. At the February 7th, 2019 BOS meeting, the board designated John Jeffries to approve and sign accounts payable and payroll warrants and Bob is designated. Yeah, I read that. I saw my name. I, I read it. <laughs> and the substitute in the event, John. I thought play. you were going to sneak this by me. <laughs> I looked at it. Can you put her on mute? <laughs> uh, that's impossible. Bob has requested that he be removed from the designation and replaced by Robert. Uh, approve open session meeting minutes for May 7th, May 21, and May 27, 2020. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. John Jeffrey, second. All in favor, Bob Springett, aye. Robin Hunter, aye. John Jeffries, aye. Okay, so I gotta get to page 16, guys. Give me a minute. Executive session. Uh, did I miss something? No, yeah, so, so I'm headed out if you're going to executive session. Thank you for having me at the meeting. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. Um, Thank so you, Janet. I think, I think you have to poll, Bob. Yeah, I, I, have the, I, I, have the, uh, I have the motion. I'll make the motion. Right. And then it has to be a roll call vote. But nowadays, everything's a roll call vote. So. Yeah, right. So <laughs> summary of this motion. Summary is board members will enter into executive session pursuant to MGL C30A S21A6 to discuss the lease of real property at 2 Denham Street. I move that the board enter into executive session not to return to open session. Consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property at 2 Denham Street. Further, as chairman, I declare that an open meeting discussion may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the town. And I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, John Jeffries? Aye, John Jeffries. Robin Hunter? Aye. Bob Springett? Aye. So now, how do we actually do this? So we leave this meeting, um, and then if you could hop on your calendar or the email that Mona sent with the executive session, it's a separate Zoom invite. So yeah, you, se separate password. It's a separate password. It's a separate. Um, it's a separate Zoom link. Um, okay, so I can declare a five-minute sort of recess for people. Oh, your last motion just took care of everything. That's it. Open session is concluded and, and done. There a bio break, I think. <laughs> All right, All right. See you in a couple of minutes. So, oh, that's just me.